We are living in one of the most exciting times in hair loss prevention history. While we've basically been stuck with the same treatments since the 1980s, things like finasteride and minoxidil, the next five to 10 years are going to completely revolutionize the space when it comes to new hair loss prevention products and hair growth stimulants. Today I'm breaking down the latest scientific breakthroughs for what is currently in development and what is on the horizon in the next five to 10 years. I'll be talking about what is gonna be the most promising stuff that's gonna be hitting the market soon and what we can realistically expect from these treatments. And some of these new developments are so promising that they're gonna make most of the treatments available to Day look really primitive. We're talking about actually regrowing hair from dead follicles and not just preventing further hair loss. I'm also gonna to try to separate some of the real science from some of just the hype products that are out there and give you realistic timelines and help you understand which breakthroughs are worth getting excited about. My name is Spencer Gilmore and I am the creator and founder of Hair Rescue. Welcome back to the channel. All right, so here we have some of the next generation pharmaceuticals, things like pyrolutamide, GT20029, Brizula, and PP405. First thing we'll start off with is pyrolutamide, otherwise known as KX826, and some people are even calling us the finasteride replacement. Pyrolutamide is actually already available and you can buy it in some places, but it is currently undergoing phase three clinical trials and it has been approved by some Japanese pharmaceutical labs and you can buy it on Amazon. However, the phase three clinical trials for FDA approval have not been fully evaluated yet. Pyrolutamide is probably the closest thing we have to the next generation finasteride and it is a topical anti-androgen similar to RU58841 and other ones out there. Like I mentioned earlier, it is going through phase three clinical trials and the results are looking very promising. Unlike finasteride, which blocks DHT production systemically because it is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, pyrolutamide attaches to the androgen receptors in your hair follicles locally, blocking DHT and testosterone from attaching to the hair follicles, making them miniaturize and fall out prematurely. This is otherwise known as anogenic alopecia. This mechanism of action allows for potentially fewer side effects from lowering your DHT levels and giving you far faster results. The phase three clinical trials are ongoing, and if successful, we could see FDA approval sometime in 2026 to 2027. What to expect from this? A similar or better effectiveness than finasteride but with significantly fewer sexual and hormonal side effects. I've actually experimented with pyrolutamide and I would say it is on similar grounds to things like RU58841. I have found that RU tends to have a better binding affinity to androgen receptors and that's what some of the data would suggest. So it seems that RU is a little bit stronger than pyrolutamide. However, if this passes through clinical trials and becomes FDA approved, it will be an absolute game changer because it's going to be something that you can add into your routine alongside 5AR inhibitors or as a standalone product, which would be absolutely amazing because 5-alpha reductase inhibitors would give you the hair loss prevention without the sexual side effects of things like tetastride and finasteride, which I know so many people are afraid of. Next compound is GT20029. This is the dual action compound. GT20029 is interesting because it works in two pathways simultaneously. It's both a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor like finasteride and an anti-androgen receptor antagonist like RU58841. Early studies have showed significant hair regrowth in just 24 weeks, with some patients seeing 20 plus new hair per square centimeter, which is ginormous hair gain, which is huge. Timeline, currently in phase two trials, realistically is probably gonna come around until 2027 to 2029 for patent approval. So that's gonna be a few years away. It's not something to be waiting on. Also, you could probably just use both of these together and I'm not sure exactly how they would be working, but I'd assume it would be an oral pill. Well, I guess it could be a topical because you do have topical finasteride. Interesting. Next one here that I think is actually really interesting is Brizula, which Brizula is already an FDA approved treatment for acne, but studies for male pattern baldness are ongoing and it's a topical anti-androgen that is believed to not go systemic at all, which could mean zero zero hormonal side effects and also zero side effects from things like RU58841 and pyrolutamide. Both of those treatments, some people say, can cause side effects when it comes to things like cardiovascular issues and lung issues, and that's one of the reasons why there's speculating that they never got patented approval or FDA approval, but pyrolutamide is in phase three clinical trials, which is a good sign. But Brizula is already FDA approved for acne and it is believed to not go systemic. The hair loss trials are ongoing and it could see approval in 2026 for hair loss. The next one here is PP405. This is a new hair compound that got a lot of serious buzz in the hair loss community. It's a selective androgen receptor degrader, a SARD, that works differently from anything we've seen before. Instead of just blocking DHT or androgen receptors, it actually degrades them. So that can lead to, you know, you no longer need to block the DHT with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor or a anti-androgen because you no longer have the androgen receptors in your hair follicles, which is a very interesting technology. What makes PP405 interesting is that the early research suggests that it would be more effective than current treatments while potentially having fewer side effects, if any. This compound is designed to treat targeted only specific androgen receptors 
reverted to hair loss while leaving the others completely alone. The hype, some early reports suggest dramatic results in animal studies with significant hair regrowth in areas that were previously thought to be dead zones. The reality is we're still in very early research phases of this and most of the excitement is based on preliminary data and anecdotal reports in research communities. The timeline, this is still in preclinical study research and it shows promise in human trials, but we're looking at probably 2030 is the earliest that we would have any potential availability. And one of the things that happens, so this happened at UCLA, I believe, or in or at Berkeley, somewhere in California. But one of the things that drugs and even technology companies will do, they will release their preliminary trials or the results from things that they have, like a technology company or an early drug saying it's the miracle drug, it's a treatment to get a lot of hypes so that investors want to buy in and fund their research really early. It's also just to gauge the market to see how they would react to something like this hitting the market. Now, usually if you have these dramatic before and after results with things that have you know no side effects or they're a you know new technology that's going to make billions and billions of dollars it gets a lot of hype and gets a lot of news coverage which means people are interested in it which means they need to continue the funding which means they need to raise more money and try to speed it up as fast as possible because the market actually wants it if they were to advertise that this drug was going to come to market but it just didn't really build up any hype they wouldn't be able to get as much funding and maybe they would just kill it off right there because they realize like okay you know we could invest all this money into clinical trials and take five you know even ten years to get it approved but nobody really wants it right now. But you know, when PP405 hit the market of saying a side effect free, you know, completely cutting edge hair growth and hair loss prevention drug, the market really got a lot of buzz and people were really excited about it. They're like, can I have it now? Can I have it now? Can I have it now? And unfortunately, it's not gonna be available till probably 2030 at the earliest because you know, FDA approval and clinical trials take years and hundreds of millions of dollars often. So that's one thing to not get too excited about, but it could be a promising treatment, but when the early preclinical research are trying to build hypes that they can raise money for the products. So we have things that are already in phase two and phase three clinical trials like pyrolutamide, brazula, and the GT20029. I love the compound names for all these. They're super interesting. The next thing we're gonna talk about is regenerative medicine breakthroughs. This is where things get really exciting. Multiple companies are working on using stem cells to actually regenerate hair follicles, not just wake up existing ones, but create entirely new ones. So similar to how you'd get a hair transplant and put new hair follicles in your scalp, hair transplants just take the hair from usually the back and sides of your head and put them to the top so that they're relocated. But if you could actually grow and make new hair follicles, that would be completely revolutionary because the biggest problem with growing new hair is that often if the hair is already gone, it's really, really tough or even impossible to regrow it. And that's why a hair transplant is one of the only options for men who have maybe gone completely bald. Uh, Stemson Therapeutics is growing hair follicles in the lab and transplanting them. Their early results show actual hair growth from completely bald areas, which I mentioned would be really exciting. Human trials are just beginning, however, and realistically, this is probably gonna be a 2030 to 2035 for widespread availability, and it's probably not gonna be very cheap. What to expect, potentially unlimited hair transplantation and no donor area limitations, which would be completely insane because donor area hair is one of the biggest problems with hair transplants today because that's why a lot of men don't want to take the drugs like finasteride and minoxidil because they don't want the side effects or it didn't give them the results they were looking for. But in order to maximize your donor hair and to maximize the success of a transplant actually working, you need to have as much donor hair as possible. So people often recommend you get on those drugs. And if they don't work that well for you or you got side effects from it, then you just have to work with the hair that you currently have. And if you're getting a hair transplant, you probably don't have that much hair to begin with. So this would be quite amazing, but it's still probably 10 years out maybe five. Hair follicle cloning, I would imagine this is very similar to the actual stem cell regrow follicles. Hair follicle cloning involves taking healthy hair follicles, multiplying them in a lab, and transplanting the clones. It could give us unlimited donor hair for transplants. So that's really the big portion here is regenerative medicine breakthroughs is going to be creating more hair so that you aren't limited to just your donor hair and you could, you know, have that like Norwood Zero super thick head full of hair because you can do multiple treatments and you could just keep getting transplants of tens of thousands of grafts. This one is in the same kind of ballpark. The Riken Research Institute in Japan has successfully cloned hair follicles in mice and achieved natural hair growth patterns, but this is still in early research and isn't even entered into clinical trials yet. So 2030s is probably the earliest for human application. Once again, probably five to 10 years out. And the next thing we have is 3D bioprinting of hair follicles, which is similar to the other two above. Scientists are literally 3D printing hair follicles and using patients' own cells. This could create perfectly matched follicles without the rejection risk. Very early research. This probably isn't going to be happening until 2035 plus, unfortunately. So, but that is a good sign. You know, if you're 22 today, 
in the next 10 years, you could have a full head of hair when you're 35 again, which would be pretty cool. I'm imagining some of this stuff would be pretty expensive though. I'm not sure about how much any of this would cost. Section number three, we have genetic and molecular approaches. So gene therapy for hair loss is something that's really cutting edge and really cool to think about. Researchers are working on gene therapies that could literally turn off the genes responsible for male pattern baldness and enhance the genes that promote hair growth. So this is kind of going into the fact that we do know that DHT causes hair loss, but it's tough to say if DHT is the actual cause of hair loss. We do know that if you eliminate DHT in the body and you basically use it as a contraceptive and get rid of it, you will likely grow back hair because one of the best results for growing back hair and stopping hair loss is uh, men transitioning to women. So that's why things like dutasteride work so well because if you take dutasteride and you don't have side effects from it, I almost guarantee you're gonna stop your hair loss. You might not regrow a ton of hair, but I guarantee you're gonna stop your hair loss because nuking your DHT to zero will likely stop it and help you regrow new hair because we just know that that works. But why I say it's tough to say if DHT is a cause of hair loss is because for around 15 to 20% of men, they have super high DHT levels around the world and no hair loss at all. So what does it come down to? It's actually your hair androgenic sensitivity. Is the hair follicles in your scalp androgen sensitive? And if they're androgen sensitive hairs, that's just your genetics and it's something that you can't really change. And that's why all these treatments are available. It's just the luck of the draw. It's like you wanted to be six foot three, but instead you're five foot eight and it's like that's just your the hand you were dealt and those are your genetics. Back to the gene therapy though, uh, the current approaches for this are using viral vectors to deliver growth promoting genes directly to the hair follicles, very interesting, and then the CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, gene editing to modify DHT sensitivity hair follicles. So that would mean, like I mentioned before, you know, we have around 15 to 20% of men who just don't lose any hair in their entire life. And that's because they just don't have androgen sensitive hair follicles. And epigenetic modifications to reactivate dormant follicles, all things that could be very interesting, but most of the stuff is still in preclinical research, kind of like the PP405. 2030s is probably the earliest that we'll be seeing this. And this is 2030s, so probably more like 2035. Still very exciting stuff that's on the horizon. Next thing is exomes therapy. Exosomes are tiny vesicles that cells use to communicate. Scientists have discovered that exosomes for young, healthy hair follicles can rejuvenate aging follicles. Several companies are developing exomes treatment that could be injected into the scalp to restart hair growth. Some treatments are already in the early trials in 2028 for potential availability. So this is really interesting. And then the section four is gonna be talking about advanced device technology. Next generation laser therapy. So currently, you know, we have red light therapy and it's pretty basic, but next generation devices are using precise wavelengths, pulse sending patterns, and even AI to optimize treatments for individual patients. Theraderm Pro or similar devices are incorporating multiple wavelengths and personalized treatment protocols. These are actually available now and will continue to improve rapidly as technology advances. I have never experimented with one of these. I do have a red light cap and I do use it probably five times a week for 30 minutes a day. I would definitely say it helps. They're a little expensive, but once you buy one, you're never gonna have to buy another one again because they won't break as long as you're not throwing it on the ground. I think they're they're good and there's a lot of data in PubMed articles and studies suggest some that it even can boost hair density and hair growth by about 38%. So I'd say they're worth using. It's just whether or not want to, you wanna buy one. And there's pretty much no side effects with this stuff. Microneedling 2.0. New microneedling devices are incorporating growth factors, peptides, and even electronical stimulation to maximize the wound healing response. Some devices can deliver treatments in precise depths while simultaneously injecting growth promoting compounds. So some of these are kind of already out. You have the automatic dermostamp devices that can go to the exact length every single time and they're electric. Advanced devices are actually becoming available now and expect major improvements over the next three years. These are all over the place and you can buy them on Amazon. And I'd say they're much better than buying a derma stamp or a derma roller. However, they're just a lot more expensive. And then you have to buy needle replacements whenever they break. You can't just buy a new device because the battery and everything costs a lot of money, but they definitely work well. And if you are not using a micro needling device at least once a week, I would highly recommend it because they can two to three X the results of the topicals you're using. And you can watch Derek from More Plates, More Dates video. He really broke down how well micro needling and minoxidil work together especially for even growing things like facial hair. Next, we have focused ultrasound therapy. Uh, researchers are using focused ultrasound to stimulate hair follicles without damaging surrounding tissue. Early studies are now showing promising results for both stimulating hair growth and improving drug delivery. Clinical trials are still ongoing. However, we can't expect this to get results or hit the market around 2027. So we're really looking at two years away for potential commercial availability of the focused ultrasound therapy. These are devices that obviously won't really have any side effects and can enhance products you're already using, they're probably not 
all going to work very well on their standalone products and should be used in conjunction with things like 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, minoxidil, topical antiandrogens, because those are going to do the bulk of the heavy lifting. But these products can definitely add, you know, two, three X the results you're getting from them. But they're going to be things that you might not want to try first and add in after you've already experimented with the drugs, because the drugs, are, like I mentioned, are going to do the bulk of the lifting. We've got section five here, artificial intelligence and personalized medicine, AI powered diagnosis and treatment are coming to the market and this is going to be one of the huge things that AI is going to take over in the medical field because AI is revolutionizing how we diagnose and treat all conditions and hair loss is going to be one of them. New systems can analyze your hair loss pattern, genetic markers, and lifestyle factors, create completely personalized treatments and protocols. So maybe you do have things like mild AGA. However, with AI and advanced diagnosis and treatment, we can find out that you're really deficient in certain things and you have poor blood flow. And so we can you know, use other treatments rather than taking five alpha reductase inhibitors and these are just things that we can diagnose and treat with these advanced systems. Basic AI tools are, of course are now available. I'm sure everyone's used ChatGPT but as it continues to get better and I think in the next three to five years I can't imagine how fast it's going to grow and what we're going to be using it for on a day-to-day -day basis but it's really exciting things. So instead of everyone taking one milligram of finasteride, future treatments will be dosed based on your specific genetic profile, metabolism, and sensitivity patterns to these drugs. This could dramatically improve effectiveness while minimizing side effects of all these drugs because you can see that maybe you have a hyper responder to things like finasteride and minoxidil, so you don't need to be taking you know one to five milligrams of this stuff. You could be using 0.25 milligrams and that will give you the great results with almost mitigating any risk of side effects. Same thing with minoxidil, same thing with topical antiandrogens, et cetera. So what is overhyped and what is actually real and what should you be looking forward to in the future? Of course, topical antiandrogens are going to be one of the big things that are going to be hitting the market because 5-alpha reductase inhibitors have been around since the 1980s and minoxidil has been around since the 1990s, but there is a plethora of people complaining about side effects and them not working for them. PP405, Brazula, and RU58841 have all been, are all going through clinical trials and will hopefully be out of clinical trials in the next two to three years to where we will find out what ones we should be using and what ones just didn't make it. Hair cloning, while promising, is still decades away from being practical and probably very unaffordable when it first comes out. And complete baldness reversal, even the best future treatments probably won't be able to completely turn someone who is bald to having a full head of hair overnight. So all these things are not miracle cures and anything claiming to be a miracle cure is probably just too good to be true. But real-time near treatment breakthroughs, like I mentioned, those topical antiandrogens and pyrolutamide are seem really cool. Exosome treatments are rushed around the corner and advanced PRP injections. AI-powered personalized treatments, obviously that's happening now, but also going to be extremely advanced in the next two to three years, as well as better topical delivery systems. New ways to get medicines deeper in the scalp and have higher effectiveness of the medicines you're using, so maybe you can use less and reduce the risk of side effects because you have advanced absorption technologies out there now. I know I just went over a whole lot. I hope I didn't bore the hell out of you with this. It was a lot of research to find all this stuff, learn a little bit about it, present it to you in hopefully a digestible way. I've learned a ton about you know, new hair loss treatments that are coming onto the market and what to expect from them. None of this stuff is absolute miracle treatments, but I hope that it can help you in deciding what to do. Topical antiandrogens seem to be something that is going to be hitting the market very soon here, and they are all available right now. The biggest one is pyrolutamide and brizula. Those are probably the two things that are really big that hopefully will hit the market and be given good reviews and FDA approval. What future treatments are you most excited for? And I'll try to stay up to date on the latest treatments and research on hair loss and hair regrowth products. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment. It helps the algorithm. This is a very small channel, but we're hoping to make it big one day. We're gonna be talking about all kinds of different things and not just hair loss treatments, probably lifestyle and business advice, but I appreciate it. And the future of hair loss treatments is incredibly promising and I'm excited for them. And I'm excited to maybe add new things to the hair rescue line like pyrolutamide, like brazula, but right now we just have RU58841 and minoxidil and then our advanced hair loss prevention oil. Those are just products that I think everyone can use, especially the oil. The oil is a basically an all-encompassing 15-in-1, one of the most comprehensive products in the market that really doesn't have any side effects. Check it out if you're looking for a beginner product or if you're looking to jump into some of the heavy hitter stuff, you could try Hair Rescue's RU58841 and minoxidil. All right, guys. Peace out. Thank you.